Hey guys, we're going to do a quick review for tomorrow's quiz because it actually covers quite a bit of information. So, when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, some important phrases that could pop up in a question about the Industrial Revolution is that this is going to be an era that is known for being very efficient in its creation of products. Instead of a cottage industry, you're going to see mass production of goods. Okay, and um, because of this mass production, the prices of goods is actually going to go down. It's going to make products cheaper and much more accessible to the public. Okay, so more people will be able to afford these products. Now, there are some different sectors that we have talked about in the Industrial Revolution, different innovations that helped these different sectors um, of our country and our economy. So the first one is right away with industry and manufacturing. We've talked about like the spinning jenny is going to speed up the process of making textiles. Well, the spinning jenny is eventually going to be used at a mass scale in the factory system. And specifically, your factory system, uh, you'll see a lot of textile mills. Remember that a textile is a fabric, okay? In these textile mills and factory systems, you're going to mostly see these in the north. And these textile mills are going to actually hire a lot of women and girls, children, to work in these factories. Okay? Um, we also talked briefly about the Bessemer steel process. And that Bessemer steel process, the mass production of steel, will actually just go ahead and lead us into the transportation sector. So let's just go ahead and talk about that next. In transportation, some of the innovations that we saw were the steam locomotive or the train. So we're going to get trains and railroads. And we like the idea of railroads and trains because it's going to connect the west to the northeast. Okay. We will also have canals. And the most famous one that we studied was the Erie Canal, these man-made rivers. And this is going to help speed up transportation and get products and people to places faster. And along the same line as canals, we talked about the steamboat. Now, it is possible that you could be asked about the inventor of the steamboat. And that inventor is Robert Fulton. And we said the memory trick to remember Robert Fulton is he would say, full steam ahead if he was on a steamboat and he needed uh, more coal added into the fire to speed up the boat. All right, next, let's move into the south. Let's go south to the agricultural sector. And we said that three inventions revived, like doing CPR on somebody, they revived the southern economy. And that was the cotton gin, the steel tip plow, and the mechanical reaper. Okay, The cotton gin, probably out of these three, is probably the most important one to know. It is invented by Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney was also the inventor of interchangeable parts, which would have been used in industry to speed up the process of making goods and make mass production of goods. Eli Whitney, though, remember his intent was to actually get rid of slavery, but the huge effect of the cotton gin is that it increases slavery or expands slavery because the farmers are going to get greedy and they're going to want to produce more cotton faster to get their huge paychecks faster. So you're actually going to see an increase in slavery because of this cotton gin. Okay. Finally, we talked about the communication sector and the big innovation in communication was the telegraph, which used Morse code for these electrical messages. And that was invented by Samuel Morse. Okay. So 
telegraph is going to be important because again similar to trains it's going to be able to connect people from the west to the north to the south but also it's going to speed up communication we're not going to have to write letters and wait weeks possibly months to get a response from people okay. now that's probably the big idea that we need big ideas that we need to know for the industrial revolution after the industrial revolution information that we've studied we moved into our fifth president of the United States and that was President James Monroe remember that the memory trick is that the fourth president is also a James but he's James Madison and then the fifth president is Monroe so they go in alphabetical order Mad and Mon okay? now as President Monroe becomes president after the war of 1812 Yes, we experienced increased industrialization in our country, but another huge effect of the War of 1812 was that we saw an increase in nationalism or extreme love or pride for America. This increased nationalism partnered with um, little political party fighting At the beginning of Monroe's presidency, oops, not party time, wrong thing, <laughs> party fighting, little political party fighting, that is going to be a time period in Monroe's presidency often referred to as the era of good feelings. So people are feeling happy, they're thinking nationalism, we're thinking about America as a whole, and everybody's just kind of getting along, which is a really good thing, especially in Congress, right? Well all good things can't last forever and so uh, we moved into the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise is actually a time when we're going to experience sectionalism and sectionalism is when you have um, more pride and concern for your section or your state in the country versus the country as a whole. But we're going to have Henry Clay, the great compromiser, come in and he's going to try to solve this problem before America tries to rip itself apart. The issue was that Missouri had wanted to enter the Union as a slave state, but that was going to throw off the balance of Congress. Well, Maine also wanted to join the Union, but it wanted to join as a free state. So Henry Clay says, all right, look, let's do this. Missouri, you can join as a slave state. Maine, you can join as a free state. And any future territories that become states in the future, if you are north of the line, you will automatically become a free state. If you are south of the line, then you will automatically become a slave state. Okay, so that was the Missouri Compromise, trying to keep each section of the country happy and to avoid a war. The Missouri Compromise was important because it balanced Congress with an equal number of slave states and an equal number of free states and it's a temporary fix or a band-aid to avoid a civil war. The last topics that we discussed were some Supreme Court cases. Now going back a couple weeks we talked about the court case of Marbury versus Madison and Marbury versus Madison is important because it establishes judicial review and this is the power for the Supreme Court to decide if laws are constitutional or unconstitutional and strike anything down that is considered unconstitutional. The leader of the Supreme Court during this time period is John Marshall and we always put muscles on him because we are reminded that he wants a strong federal government. Okay. Because John Marshall is a Supreme Court judge, he actually serves for life. He is not going to have to run for election, and so he'll be around for a lot more court cases. So the next court case that we talked about today was McCullough versus Maryland. And we said the memory trick for this one is M.M. Money. Remember that the state of Maryland was trying to tax the federal bank that was located in Maryland. Well, John Marshall, he's still part of the Supreme Court and he rules in favor of the federal government. And so in McCullough versus Maryland, he says that states, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> cannot tax 
any federal institution. So if it's a federal bank, if it's a federal library, if it's a federal um, archives, the states cannot tax those institutions in their states. Okay. All right. And then the last court case we talked about was Gibbons versus Ogden. And our memory trick, our memory trick for Gibbons versus Ogden is G O steamships go. Okay. And so these two guys both owned and operated a steamboat company on the Hudson River. But the problem was that one guy had um, his license from New York State. The other guy had his license from the federal government. And so again, if John Marshall is the Supreme Court Chief Justice, you know he's going to rule in favor of that strong federal government. And so, because the business was taking place between states, he says, you know what, state of New York courts, you're not allowed to make any choices and decisions about these um, issues in these businesses because it's happening between states. Only the federal government can regulate or control or make decisions Interstate commerce, and again, interstate commerce is when a business is operating in between states. So it happens in more than one state. Now, it is quite possible that somebody could ask you about John Marshall. Yes, obviously, he's the chief justice in all three of these cases, but what you really need to know about him is that he's always going to vote in favor of a strong federal government in any case. And that all three of these court cases, if somebody says, what do these three have in common? You would say again that these cases are going to prove the strength of the federal government over state government's powers. Okay, so federal gov over states.